We are pleased to have joining with us now a man who believes that really the right tools, policies, and inspiration can make a difference and that the poor among us can actually save capitalism. We welcome to our program John Hope Bryant, the chairman and CEO of Operation Hope. John, we thank you for your time today here on America's Forum. My honor to be here. Congratulations on the new TV show. It's and, fantastic. And see you add to it. Yeah. That's why we're so glad you are here on our premiere as we're seeing on various satellite services. The title of your new book, How the Poor Can Save Capitalism, that becomes the obvious question. How in your mind will that happen? Well, in some ways they already are. Um, the Half of the equation, the, the argument's already been made. Um, you look at the automobiles, um, cell phones, uh, restaurants, um, uh, all really uh, luxuries for the wealthy uh, when they first came out. Um, but uh, Henry Ford was smart enough to not only make a quality automobile, but to work, pay his workers enough to buy the automobiles they were making, and voila, you had a middle class. You look at cell phones, you and I, uh, I'm being a little presumptuous here with your history and background, but we're probably from the same age group, we, we had that $3,000 Motorola brick <laughs> on our shoulder <laughs> yeah. when cell phones first came out. Uh, it, was, it was 45 cents a minute, and it was really, you know, it was a prestige item. But you're not going to build shareholder value on that. Now, cell phones are ubiquitous. It's, it's, uh, pe people in Africa will probably have, uh, it'll be the first wireless continent. They'll have cell phones. They won't even have landline phones. In fact, people have cell phones that don't have running uh, water, almost a billion people there and almost 700,000, 800,000 cell phones. So it, it, the, the U.S. economy is 70% consumer driven today. And people who make $50,000 a year or less, who are half of the U.S. economy, with too much month at the end of their money, I might add, are driving this economy. They take 80 to 90% of every dollar and put it back in the economy. So when you and I were getting coffee this morning, when we were dropping our kids off at daycare, uh, when you were brushing your teeth, I mean, nobody gave you toothpaste. <laughs> you went and bought it. So uh, from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to the bed at night, you're engaging in a financial and economic transaction other than God and love. Uh, your life is about economics and money. And so uh, the, the, the poor and the struggling class and the teetering middle class don't get credit uh, for driving a $17 trillion economy, the largest economy uh, in the world. And, and that's really the first point, is that they are already doing it. They get no credit for it. Now we need to shift to the demand side, the opportunity side, as you were saying earlier, the ownership side. <clears throat> and John, you write that political leaders are ignoring the one force that could jumpstart the stalled economy. Can you tell our viewers what that force is? Well, and by the way, it's, it's all political leaders. This is, uh, I believe, in the bum factor. There are 20 percent of Republicans that are bums. There are 20 percent of Democrats that are bums. I got bums in my own family. <laughs> uh, so you, 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 you have people who mean well, but if you've never, paid, never met a payroll before, if you never owned a business before, then you can't give what you don't have in a blind town and one-eyed man's king. If you don't know better, you can't do better. So the politicians have the same problem that the so-called poor and the struggling middle class have, and that is they never got the memo. So. My probably one of America's favorite presidents, Abraham Lincoln. You know, we all know he, he brought it into the Civil War. We know he signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And really, with most people, that's where the story ends. That's where the story begins. A couple days later, March 3rd, 1865, Lincoln signed the Freedmen's Bureau Act. The Freedmen's Bureau Act created the Freedmen's Bank. The Freedmen's Bank's mission was to teach freed slaves about money. Now, just stop right there. <laughs> This is radical, 1865, the most important thing that Lincoln thought he could do, other than emancipation and, and physical freedom, was to put a bank across the street from the White House. So you had the Department of War to the left, which is now OEOB, Executive Office Building. To the right, you had uh, the White House, the Treasury Department, and across the street, where Bank of America is now, you had the Freedmen's Bank to teach free slaves about money. He thought the most important thing he could do was to give them a, to root them in free enterprise and capitalism so that they could operate in this system. And then another general came along and said, why don't you give them 40 acres and a mule also, land and collateral. Lincoln said, okay, great. Um, could you imagine what this country would be like five or 10, if he had lived five or 10 years? He, he was killed two weeks uh, later. The whole plan was reversed. The bank fell into disrepair. Uh, and literally, 100 years snapped by until Dr. King and my hero and mentor, Ambassador Andrew Young, stepped in in 1965. And in 68, they called for a poor people's campaign. Now, there are more poor white 
people in America than poor anybody else. So I don't want your viewers to think I'm talking about a black thing. Whether you're black, white, brown, or yellow, you want to see some more green. Today, <laughs> the issue is not race. It's class. You do a class, you get race for free. Well, John, let's talk about that a little bit because, you know, when we talk about this issue of capitalism potentially being in trouble, we, one of the things we talk about is income inequality here, and you hear most of yeah. the solutions to that problem coming from the left here. Is there a free market, capitalistic way to deal with the issue of income inequality? I, I think that there is. I, I, there's two approaches, one of which your, your viewers will find maybe crazy, but I think it's common sense. I think this whole book is about a radical movement of common sense. The first one uh, is we need to create more entrepreneurs, uh, more small business owners, and you say, wait a minute, that's, you, you, weren't you talking about income inequality? The guy who made the suit that I'm wearing came into the Operation Hope looking for a job. He wanted to be a clothier. But, you know, life's about relationships. He didn't know any clothiers. He didn't know the industry, so he couldn't get hired. I said, why don't you go become a clothier? He had never thought of it before. We raised his credit score. 120 points over 18 months. Nothing changed your life more than God or love than moving your credit score 120 points. And um, his self-esteem increased, his financial IQ increased, his sense of identity increased, his options expanded. He started a business, make a long story short, he's doing between $800,000 and a million dollars a year in revenue, drove clothing, people can look it up on the web. I buy all my suits at market prices, by the way, from him, uh, not because it's a black business or out of charity, it's just a good, it's just a good suit. Uh, and he has got six employees, he's paying his taxes, raising his children, contributing to America, has his own nonprofit to pay it for it. That's the American dream. The other side of that piece, because everybody can't be an entrepreneur, although everybody needs to have an entrepreneurial mindset to succeed in this world, is, is the pure issue of income. I don't think we should be debating a minimum wage that's government uh, required. Uh, I think we should be talking about a living wage that's free market uh, inspired. Here's what I mean. If, if you pay me a minimum wage, first of all, I need a job and a half to survive, but I barely have mo enough money for, uh, for rent and a car note. I can't go to a restaurant and, and keep the restaurants in business. I can't go buy a new refrigerator every eight years and keep GE in business. I can't go buy an automobile or lease it every five to seven years to keep the Ford Motor in business. Um, but if you give me a living wage, I put more money into that economy, which is what I was saying earlier and everything grows, and my and business is more prosperous because it's self-determinant. And John Hope, Brian, one commodity, uh, regardless of where we rank on the socioeconomic scale, that we can't buy is time. Regrettably, we're about out of time, <laughs> but we thank you for joining us from Atlanta. We look forward to finding out thank more you. on your book, How the Poor Can Save Capitalism. Interesting thought, I, and I, uh, we very much appreciate you for coming on. John Hope, Bryant. Uh, you see what President Clinton has to say about the new book, and we'll have more to say when we return on America's Forum.